Good evening. I'm sincerely grateful to Dr. Jerry Skira and Dr. Frank Sisson for inviting me to this evening uh, book launch and a lecture followed by a response and questions and answers. So my lecture notes contain a reminder uh, to update the opening section in the event that there was more breaking news in the last 30 minutes on the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Um, it's fitting and necessary to begin with a quick review of current affairs, and I want to do so by briefly identifying the possible next steps that might be adopted by the Orthodox Church in Ukraine that I iterated in the conclusion to my book. Given Ukraine's history of dependence on others, I suggested that the best next step for the church was to resolve their own problems without seeking external mediation or intervention. In modern history, there has really only been one all-Ukrainian Orthodox Church Council in 1918, and most historians and theologians do not refer to the 1918 Council as authoritative for several reasons, probably because its adoption of canonical autonomy was never truly realized since 1918, even though the Moscow Council of 1918 confirmed Ukrainian autonomy. External political interference prohibited the convocation of another all-Ukrainian council in 1942 and again in the early 1990s, which constituted the two occasions in the last 100 years with the greatest potential for an internal resolution. The other options for the church in Ukraine were to appeal to an external authority for resolution or to attempt to create a canonical church that would exist alongside the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. I was privy to a handful of the conversations taking place from 2016 to 2018, and two simple phrases sum up the objective. Make everyone canonical, and canonical plurality. Pursuit of canonical plurality was an acknowledgement of two opposing realities. The previously so-called uncanonical churches, namely the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church and Kievan Patriarchate, were never going to submit to the Moscow Patriarchate, and the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine was not going to resume the path to attaining canonical autocephaly. The events of 2018, which are still in progress, as we know, with the Unification Sabor scheduled for Saturday, December 15th, are the products of a combination of all the scenarios I enumerated. Following a series of appeals from the church and the state, the ecumenical patriarchate filled the role of the external authority on October 11th by declaring the uncanonical autocephalous church in Kievan patriarchate to be canonical when the synod annulled the canonical sanctions of the Moscow patriarchate imposed upon Metropolitan Makari and Patriarch Filaret and restore their faithful to full communion with the church. The exarchs appointed by the ecumenical patriarchate prepared the Sobor of December 15th, and in a few days there will be two canonical Orthodox churches in Ukraine existing side by side, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine and the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. And just an aside, uh, recently the ecumenical patriarch's letter to Metropolitan Anufri became public where he said, after the unification sabor, if you remain under the Moscow Patriarchate, you no longer have the right to carry the title Metropolitan of Kiev and all Ukraine. So we do have a, a, a recent update. Despite this landmark achievement, the emergence of canonical plurality has a strong downside because all is not well among Orthodox Christians in Ukraine, as the Moscow Patriarchate severed communion with the ecumenical patriarchate and reiterates a now old claim that the uncanonical remain uncanonical and schismatics remain schismatics. The Moscow Patriarchate's particular position on canonicity and schism has taken on a new dimension with reverberations beyond Ukraine. They claim that by restoring schismatics to the church, the ecumenical patriarchate has itself become polluted by the schism and is now schismatic. The status of schismatic is like a contagious virus. Those who come into contact with other schismatics catch the virus and suffer from the same symptoms. Essentially, they catch schismatitis. <laughs> For the Moscow patriarchate, the only legitimate method of resolving the crisis is 
is for the schismatics to repent and to return to the bosom of the mother church, from their perspective, Moscow. When that happens, they promise to address all of the issues that led to the separation of believers in the first place. <clears throat> a closer look at the respective positions of two Orthodox churches in Ukraine leads to a thesis. The Moscow Patriarchate is attempting to reinforce their self-appointed identity of canonicity, while, and this appears to be the new name of the church, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine will be exulting in their liberation from Moscow. Can the two Orthodox churches in Ukraine overcome their differences and unite into one church? While this final step is not currently in sight, I think it would be helpful to reflect how we arrived at this point in the first place. This was the purpose of my book, The Orthodox Church in Ukraine, to analyze the modern autocephalous movement and the imprinting of identity features on the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. For convenience, I began with 1917, as the collapse of the Tsarist regime cleared a path for Ukrainian national and ecclesial sovereignty. For both the state and the church, establishing sovereignty and independence was possible only through liberation from Muscovite tyranny. For the church, that tyranny was experienced by the subordination of the Kievan Metropolia to Moscow in 1686 a relationship that resulted in attempts to conform the Kievan church to Moscow through russification and canonical and liturgical uniformity. For the rest of our session tonight, I will draw from my book to show how Ukrainian attempts at securing ecclesial liberation from Moscow were countered by a rejection of the canonical legitimacy of the formation of new church bodies in Ukraine. The key point is that the current ecclesial standoff in Ukraine, defined formally through canonical interpretations of ecclesial legitimacy, are the products of a process of identity formation that has essentially been passed on from one generation of church leaders and faithful to the next, beginning in 1917-18, up until today. We need to begin with a quick word about the events surrounding the 1686 subordination of the Kievan Metropolia to Moscow. This is an issue of serious dispute. Unfortunately, the debate on how one should interpret the letter of Patriarch Dionysius IV requesting that Moscow ordain the Metropolitan of Kiev, who was to continue to commemorate the Ecumenical Patriarchate, overshadows the real politique shaping the environment of this event. Boris Gudziak's detailed presentation of the Ecumenical Patriarchate's elevation of the Russian Church from Metropolia to Patriarchate exposes the power dynamics of Orthodoxy in the 16th and 17th centuries. The activities of the Tsar and the Russian aristocracy during Patriarch Jeremiah's stay in Moscow illustrate the cushion of state power surrounding the Russian church and expose the ecumenical patriarchate in the 17th century, or 16th century, excuse me, as the head of a church lacking the support of an empire. Moscow enjoyed all of the strategic positioning that set the stage for the establishment of a patriarchate, and they extended this leverage over Kyiv on the basis of the Treaty of Pereyaslav in 1654 and the Ecumenical Patriarchate's appeal that Moscow ordain the Kievan Metropolitan. We know, historically, that Moscow used this position of strength to russify Ukrainians, a policy that included requirements of liturgical uniformity, <coughs> changes in the pronunciation of Church Slavonic at the liturgy, and making Russian the compulsory language of instruction in the academies. Two opposing interpretations of 1654 and 1686 are crucial for the modern history of the Ukrainian church. Moscow interpreted 1654 and 1686 as the restoration of one Rus, Yedin Rus, the reunification of peoples who had been separated because of Mongol, Polish, and Lithuanian aggression. Some Ukrainians viewed these events as the inauguration of Tsarist enslavement of Ukraine and the Kievan Metropolia. Ecclesially, from the Ukrainian perspective, 
The bishops of the Russian church were complicit in this enslavement because of the oaths of loyalty they made to the Tsar during their confessions of faith that form an integral part of the process of ordination and appointment. The Ukrainians seeking liberation from Tsarist tyranny initially sought to obtain it through conventional methods by working through legitimate mechanisms. The first attempt occurred when the All-Ukrainian Orthodox Church Council in Kyiv petitioned Patriarch Tikhon for a blessing to convoke an All-Ukrainian Council, despite the opposition of Metropolitan Volodymyr of Kyiv. The Moscow Patriarchate's initial response was positive, as the Patriarch blessed the convocation of an All-Ukrainian Council, but the Moscow Patriarchate engaged in inconsistent policy in its own response to the Ukrainian autocephalist movement by invoking unilateral decisions to manipulate the constituency of delegates to the All-Ukrainian Council. The removal of obvious autocephaly sympathizers and their replacement with pro-Russian delegates moved the pendulum from autocephaly to autonomy. And surprisingly, the 1918 Council adopted autonomy instead of autocephaly. The Council also retained Church Slavonic as the official language of the liturgy. Ukrainian was blessed only for the reading of the Gospel on Pascha. When the newly restored Moscow Patriarchate confirmed autonomy for Ukraine, the Moscow Patriarchate declared the 1918 All-Ukrainian Council and its decisions as canonical. For pro-autocephaly Ukrainians, this series of events confirmed their lack of trust in Moscow to honor the rules of conventional proceedings. The Ukrainians therefore turned from convention to subversion in their tactics, negotiating with the Soviet authorities independently of the bishops of the Patriarchal Exarchate in Ukraine to obtain use of temples for Ukrainian language liturgies, a path that resulted in the official registration of Ukrainian parishes. After tolerating this for a short while, the Russian bishops in Ukraine responded forcefully by suspending and deposing Ukrainian clergy who presided at such services without explicit episcopal blessings from the ranks of holy orders. The bishops made these decisions from the canonical power that they had over the lower clergy, and the result was twofold. First, these canonical decisions essentially excised Ukrainians from the church who threatened the internal unity of the Moscow Patriarchate. Second, their removal from the ranks of the clergy delegitimized them. Any and all activities involving suspended or deposed Ukrainian clergy from this point forward were illegitimate by definition, evidenced by a letter from the Synod of Patriarchal Bishops in Ukraine addressing all Orthodox faithful and reminding them that, quote, those who are deposed from orders and priests who are suspended from liturgical service are not permitted to perform any church services or sacraments, and celebrating them does not yield any gracious power. End quote. It is at this early point in the modern history of the Ukrainian church that canonicity becomes a crucial feature of ecclesial identity. The question of who is and who is not canonical shapes the strategy of the Moscow Patriarchate before the Ukrainians convene the October 1921 Council to complete their separation from the Moscow Patriarchate. When that separation occurs, liberation from tyranny and canonicity develop concurrently through the history of the Ukrainian struggle for autocephaly. The employment of the canonical nuclear option by the Moscow Patriarchate did not deter the Ukrainians and they continued to privilege subversion over conventional methods. A preliminary meeting of the autocephalists in May 1921 rejected the 1918 Council and condemned the bishops of the Moscow Patriarchate as traitors because their loyalty to the Tsar superseded their ministry in Christ. A quote from the Proceedings and Declarations of the May 1921 Gathering in Cave. It is affirmed that the so-called All-Ukrainian Church Council of 1918 was not an authentic Ukrainian council, but meetings of enemies of the Ukrainian Church Liberation Movement, and so neither its resolutions nor the creation of the higher governing organ of the council is to be recognized. 
It is affirmed that the so-called Holy Synod of bishops of all Ukraine, members of which were not elected by Ukrainian Orthodox people, is not an authentic representative of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, but an adversarial institution. End quote. The subversive tactics were strongest during the course of the October Council when the autocephalists used a conciliar rite of ordination to ordain their first two bishops. They also permitted bishops to be married and created an entirely new set of canons that honored modernization, completing the initial separation from the Moscow Patriarchate. If the Moscow Patriarchate was steadfast in its adherence to canonicity, the autocephalous church's fidelity to liberation from tyranny was equally firm. The collision of these two mindsets occurred when the ecumenical patriarchate granted autocephaly to the church in Poland in 1924. Interestingly, in 1926, the Ukrainian autocephalous church in Ukraine protested Polish autocephaly and claimed that it was unnecessary since the Ukrainian people themselves elected their own native metropolitan. This is Vasily Dupivsky. It was unnecessary to receive autocephaly from the ecumenical patriarchate when Kiev had restored her native church without the external intervention of monarchs or patriarchs. Quote from the epistle sent from the 1926 Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church. The Ukrainian church has already proclaimed this kind of autocephaly. It was not proclaimed in Warsaw or by some other enemy within the life of the Ukrainian nation, but in the city of Kiev, not by patriarchs or princes, but by the Ukrainian people itself, which gathered for its all-Ukrainian church council in the year 1921." The struggle for autocephaly took a decisive turn in the case of Ukrainian constituency within the church in Poland. While they shared many of the same core principles and values as the autocephalous church, such as Ukrainization, liberation from the Muscovite yoke, and autocephaly, they established their firm commitment to traditional Orthodox canonicity and sought to establish autocephaly in German-occupied Ukraine through the intervention of the church in Poland. This decisive return to canonicity became a permanent fixture for pro-autocephaly Ukrainians and remains so to this day. When the Germans occupied Ukraine in 1941, the bishops confronted the dilemma of defining their canonical territory with yet another shift in national borders. After World War I, when most of West Ukraine was within Polish borders until September of 1939, when Soviets occupied the eastern territories of Poland, during the brief two-year period under Soviet rule, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine was severely persecuted. When the Germans arrived in 1941, some church leaders greeted them as liberators from the Muscovite yoke. But the Orthodox bishops under German occupation could not agree on a definition for their canonical status because of yet another change in borders. In this case, there were two internal disagreements on canonical matters. The cohort of bishops that settled in the Pachayev Monastery identified the 1918 All-Ukrainian Council as the defining canonical event and reverted to autonomous status within the Moscow Patriarchate. Their bishops understood that the future was blurry. They acknowledged that autocephaly was possible, but only with the convocation of another All-Ukrainian Council. The Ukrainian bishops that remained within the jurisdiction of the Church in Poland viewed the Tomos of 1924 as the authoritative canonical act and refused to move from the church in Poland to the Moscow Patriarchate. With the blessing and support of Metropolitan Dionysia of Warsaw, they pursued autocephaly for the church in Ukraine and thus came into conflict with the autonomous cohort of bishops. A series of events during the war complicated matters. First, the remaining clergy of the 1921 uh, autocephalous church in Ukraine sought entry into the 1942 church. As a canonical church, the 1942 or second autocephalous church decided to receive these clergy as they were, consistent with their ordinations from the 1921 church 
despite its canonical deficiencies. The 1942 autocephalus composed a rite of return of priests from a different ordination, this is the title of the ritual, as a method of receiving the 1921 clergy without reordaining them. The rite consists of prayers of absolution, followed by the laying on of hands and a prayer. The autonomous bishops rejected the canonicity of this rite and referred to this decision as an act of, quote, restoration of Lipkivshina, a heretical act. The autonomous called for the canonical deposition of all clergy who joined the autocephalous church, concelebrated with it, and commemorated its bishops. The autocephalous church responded angrily, pointing out that the autonomous were the only orthodox to describe the 1921 autocephalous church as heretical, and that the execution of many of their clergy resulted in the bloodshed of martyrs that, quote, consecrated their orders. The events of 1942 to 1943 witness to the intensification of intra-Orthodox polemics in Ukraine. The dispute over the canonical legitimacy of receiving the 1921 clergy into the church was one of many issues separating the autonomous from the autocephalists. The most explosive issue was practical. The use of Ukrainian for the liturgy instead of church Slavonic, as the autocephalists favored Ukrainian while the autonomists retained Slavonic. We note two trends in the short but intense church events of the World War II era. The autocephalists adopted the traditional strategy of obtaining the advocacy of an external patron for seeking autocephaly, in this case, the Metropolitan of Warsaw. We might refer to this as a soft subversion. It is a less direct challenge because of the relative absence of Moscow from Ukraine during the period of the war, but the active role of a canonical patron set a precedent for the next two stages of the autocephalist movement. The autonomist appeal for canonical deposition of anyone who joined the new church conformed to the method of excision adopted by Moscow in 1920. In other words, simply remove the illegitimate figures from the church to separate the goats from the sheep. The polemics intensified when the Synod of the Moscow Patriarchate deposed Metropolitan Polycarp Sikorsky and all of the autocephalous bishops on March 28, 1942 for, quote, leading the church into schism. You will hear that phrase again. Metropolitan Sergei accused Metropolitan Polycarp of creating an alliance with the fascists and betraying the interests of the people. This is another definitive development in the identity features of the churches. From Moscow's perspective, not only were the autocephalous schismatics, but they were also fascists. The Cold War period witnessed to the Moscow Patriarchate's coercive liquidation of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church and the coerced return of Greek Catholics to Orthodoxy. The same ideology used to align fascists with autocephalist orthodox, was used to celebrate the reunion of all of Ukraine. The Moscow Patriarchate hailed Ukraine's reunion with Russia, inaugurated in 1654, as a liberation from the tyranny of political fascism and Catholic proselytism. The Moscow Patriarchate presented its official position on the dual ecclesial political reunion of Ukraine and Russia achieved through the pseudo Sobor of Lviv and an essay authored by Archbishop Prehori of Ushrod and Mukachev and published in the Pravoslavny Visnik in 1969. Archbishop Prehori extolled the Treaty of Pereyaslav in 1654 as a reunion. Quote, the question on the union of Ukraine with Russia was first established by Metropolitan Iov Goretsky of Kiev and Halych a native of Galicia. This union, even though it did not include the entire Ukrainian nation, was made by the glorious national Ukrainian hero Hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky, who established the foundation of an indivisible common life 
of the two fraternal nations through the Pereyaslav Treaty. End quote. Galicia was finally included in this liberation thanks to the Soviet army. According to Archbishop Prehori, reunion with the Soviet regime assisted in the battle of all of fraternal nations with the Soviet Union with Hitler's hordes in the Great Patriotic War. Archbishop Prehori praised the victory of the Soviet army over, quote, human-hating fascism, end quote, which resulted in the liberation of all the Ukrainian regions and the reunion into, quote, one native Ukrainian Soviet Republic, end quote. The archbishop came full circle in his argument, stating that the military victory over the fascists resulted in a political reunion that enabled the church to put an end to ecclesial division, namely the Latin Unia, to which Ukrainians had belonged for a few centuries. The autocephalist movement did not dissipate during the Cold War. It migrated west, and its liberation theology discovered instant compatibility with North American values of democracy and religious liberty. The Ukrainian Orthodox churches in Canada and the United States employed Cold War rhetoric in an attempt to exploit religious persecution of Greek Catholics and autocephalists. The autocephalists enhanced their strategy of adopting an external patron through a series of steps that strengthened the relationship with the ecumenical patriarchate. In both Canada and the United States, Ukrainians slowly developed a relationship with the ecumenical patriarchate. For example, when the millennium of the baptism of Rus Ukraine was celebrated in South Brook, New Jersey, Ecumenical Patriarch Dimitrio sent his official greetings and blessing to the Ukrainian Orthodox community and appointed Bishop Isaiah of the Greek Orthodox Church to attend the divine services. In other words, the Ecumenical Patriarchate was receptive to Ukrainian overtures. While they did not yet concelebrate, their attendance at these events demonstrated the beginning of a relationship that would result in the reception of the, of the Canadian Church in 1990 and the American Church in 1995 via concelebration of the Eucharist. Now, concelebration of the Eucharist is not reordination, and the absence of new ordinations indicates that the Ecumenical Patriarchate honored the canonical legitimacy of the Diaspora Churches, and the Moscow Patriarchate protested this vehemently when Patriarch Alexei II wrote Patriarch Bartholomew in protest, referring to the entire scope of events that branded the autocephalist Ukrainians as uncanonical from 1921 to 1995, with specific mention of the actions taken to remove autocephaly supporters from the Church, namely deposition from holy orders and anathematization. The consistent Ukrainian propositioning of the ecumenical patriarchy over the course of many years set the stage for the events of our current situation, with the ecumenical patriarch replacing the church in Poland as the external mediator capable of liberating Ukraine from Russian tyranny. A number of events in Ukraine set the stage for this moment, especially the decline of the Soviet Union and Ukrainian independence. When the Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church returned to the Soviet Union in 1989, it began as an internal migration away from the Moscow Patriarchate. The autocephalous Church's election of Metropolitan Mstislav as its primate and the conciliar decision to elevate their canonical status to a patriarchate were subversive acts, as Mstislav was a living relic of the autocephalous predecessor in 1942 and redefining the autocephalous church's canonical status as patriarchal posed a direct challenge to the authority of the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. We should take a moment to marvel at the resilience of the autocephalous movement. Had it essentially been exiled from Ukraine only to return from paradisical exile? The resilience of this church is comparable to the immediate restoration and return of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church when it was legalized in the same year, 1989. The return of the Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church and its self-declaration as a patriarchal church 
unleashed a barrage of exchanges of blows that followed the pattern established in 1920, only with more intensity. After the Moscow Patriarchate's attempt to elevate the stature of its church in Ukraine by changing its canonical status from exarchate to broad autonomy, Metropolitan Filaret must have realized that the autocephalists were impervious to the usual strategy of polemical dismissal as uncanonical. He galvanized his own episcopate, his critics say, with the cruel force of a dictator, to appeal to Moscow for autocephaly twice, in November of 1991 and April of 1992. Moscow responded by accusing Filaret of leading the church into schism, I told you you'd hear that again, and attempted to force him to retire. When Filaret reneged on his promise to retire when he returned to Kiev from Moscow, his own bishops abandoned him by gathering in Kharkiv to elect a new primate. Moscow effectively excised Filaret from the church by not only deposing him, but adopting the most brutal nuclear option of anathematization in 1997. When Filaret's merger with the autocephalous church in June of 1992 resulted in the emergence of three Orthodox churches in Ukraine, the Autocephalous Church, the Kievan Patriarchate, and the Moscow Patriarchate, the Autocephalous proved resilient to Moscow's consistent delegitimization campaign. A new factor contributed both to Autocephalous resilience and to the emergence of a new dissidence within the Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. Russia's manipulations of an eventual war against Ukraine occurred in the post-Soviet period where it was difficult to justify the borders of canonical territory that were based on the political borders of the Soviet Union. Despite his dubious canonical status, Filaret continued the Ukrainization policies of his predecessors to attain impressive popularity among the Ukrainian people. Filaret also drew from the Canadian and American policies of obtaining the favor of an external patron the Ecumenical Patriarchate. In addition to his six appeals to the Ecumenical Patriarchate to annul the Moscow Patriarchate's canonical sanctions against him and his church, Filaret authorized the relinquishing of his church's patriarchal status in exchange for canonical autocephaly. The autocephalous church, reduced in size with the rise of the Kievan Patriarchate, had always looked to the Ecumenical Patriarchate as its patron and ritualized this relationship by commemorating the Ecumenical Patriarchate at its liturgical services. I want to be honest. I find it odd that people are so surprised that the Ecumenical Patriarchate exercised its position of privilege within Orthodoxy to resolve the Ukrainian division since they attempted to take this very same course of action with the same appointed exarchs in 2015. The problem then was that the process collapsed when the autocephalous church and the Kievan Patriarchate disagreed on the name of the new church. Moscow's attempt to sabotage the Holy and Great Council in Crete in 2016, along with yet another appeal from the Ukrainian president and parliament for autocephaly, finally inspired the Ecumenical Patriarchate to act. Each party remained true to the strategies formed by its identity in this period. The Ukrainians continued to define autocephaly as an instance of liberation from Russian tyranny, and Moscow simply added the Ecumenical Patriarchate to its list of schismatics. The hardening of the respective positions over the course of a century poses a serious obstacle to the possibility of the reconciliation of all of these churches. Conclusion. This brief review of select events from the modern history of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine illustrates how the origins of the autocephalist movement established a number of patterns of Ukrainian autocephalist actions followed by Muscovite church responses that were shaped by power dynamics. Within the church, the bishops of the Moscow Patriarchate carried canonical power, and the autocephalists used subversion to, obt to obtain their objectives, 
when conventional methods proved ineffective. The history of the autocephalist movement is characterized by this power struggle between subversion and canonicity. With neither side able to gain the upper hand, the autocephalist turned to an external authority. As of today, it looks like the autocephalists have finally achieved their objective. I'm kind of afraid to say that in public, because who knows what's going to happen. But only on account of the following series of conditions that made autocephaly possible. First, political conditions in Ukraine created a vacuum after World War I and the collapse of the Tsarist regime. It's not particularly surprising that the church in Ukraine sought autocephaly because, like the governing peoples, the church was adjusting to its new borders. The Ukrainian case followed the pattern established by the Balkan nations in the 19th and 20th centuries, with autocephalous churches appearing in independent nation-states. Ukraine was unable to secure ecclesial autocephaly because of the fragility of the Ukrainian state. The autocephalous movement emerged with vigor at each glimpse of statehood, but both the church and the state were denied by the violent intervention of the Soviet Empire until 1991. Despite Ukraine's struggles for stability since declaring independence, Ukraine has been able to retain sovereignty, and the autocephalous movement has grown steadily since then. Considering the recent history, one really should not be surprised that the Orthodox Church would be able to secure canonical autocephaly by 2018. I would argue that this is the natural result of an organic process conforming to the pattern of ecclesial autocephaly accompanying national sovereignty in countries with significant Orthodox populations. In other words, since the 19th century, this is how Orthodoxy does autocephaly. Ironically, it was the Maidan and Russian aggression in Crimea and Donbass that <clears throat> formed the point of no return for this process of autocephaly. Now, in the coming years, I think it's likely that Ukrainian autocephaly will be ritually memorialized as liberation from tyranny. There's an opportunity here for historians to note how new tyrants replaced their predecessors in this history. The Ukrainians identified the Tsar and the bishops who swore loyalty to him during their ordinations as the tyrants from whom the church required liberation. In the early Soviet period, only the patriarchal bishops were the tyrants. Red Moscow became the new tyrant. Assisted by the bishops who shifted their loyalty from the Tsar to the Soviet regime in 1927, of course this was a matter of their own survival, we have to note that. Red Moscow and the Moscow Patriarchate remained the tyrants until the middle of the post-Soviet period, when the Ruski Mir initiative targeted Ukraine as its prize, and Vladimir Putin and Moscow Patriarch Kirill became the new tyrants. Patriarch Filaret went as far as to name Putin the new king. A crucial question for the emerging Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Will it ever shed the identity of a persecuted slave it has inherited from its legacy of liberation from tyranny? The most powerful asset possessed by the Moscow Patriarchate throughout this historical period is canonicity. When the autocephalists employed subversive tactics to achieve their objective, Moscow responded with canonical suspensions, depositions, and anathematization, say that three times fast, that delegitimized the revolutionaries and removed them from the church. Moscow's defense of its canonical punishments of Filaret were not original. They repeated the same response inaugurated when the Patriarchal Synod suspended and deposed the Ukrainian priest who registered parishes in 1919 and 1920. Filaret's deposition is almost a carbon copy of Moscow's canonical action against Metropolitan Polycarp of the 1942 Autocephalous Church. They attempted to depose Polycarp and all of the bishops of the 1942 Church, even though they were ordained in and supported by the primate of the Autocephalous Orthodox <clears throat> Church in Poland. Despite this tactical deficiency, Moscow invoked the canonical sanctions issued against the World War II era Ukrainian bishops to delegitim delegitimize them within the global Orthodox Commonwealth.
strategy that proved effective until the ecumenical patriarchate received the Canadian and American churches via Eucharistic concelebration, not reordination, in 1990 and 1995. The Ecumenical Patriarchate's annulment of Moscow's canonical sanctions against Filaret and Makari not only illuminated questions about Moscow's use of canonicity as a strategy, but marked the intervention of a third party who enjoys substantial authority within the global Orthodox community and used it to diminish Moscow's influence. I conclude with a remark about the one missing piece and it's the most serious one, the matter no one seems to be discussing, but it's the most urgent pastoral issue. The dispute between Kyiv and Moscow and among Orthodox Ukrainians has raged for almost 100 years. We have reviewed samples of subversive actions and aggressive responses that are invoked with reference to past actions in the present. The consequences of these actions are dire. It's bad enough that Ukrainians are unable to celebrate the Eucharist together because of divisions among hierarchs. But the epithets that have been used to discredit the opponents have become part of the church's culture and are now multi-generational. It is traditional to teach the people of one church that the people of the other church are not Christian and are evil. This is ecclesially sanctioned demonization, and it is antithetical to Christian anthropology and ecclesiology. This demonization is not limited to Ukrainians and Russians either. Plenty of Orthodox people throughout the world are joining the bandwagon of one side and seem to exult in heaping one insult upon another on opponents who share the same faith in the same Lord. The triumph enjoyed by the autocephalists on Saturday, if it comes to pass, will become a mere whimper, a footnote to a tragic historical period if Orthodox Ukrainians cannot overcome 100 years of intra-church polemics and reconcile. This reconciliation will be possible only if church leaders will call for a ceasefire and reach out to their own brothers and sisters of the same faith in an attempt to rebuild community. If the peace of Jesus Christ overtakes the intra-church war in Ukraine, it will give the historians and theologians less to write about. I would gladly take a break from reporting on news in the church in Ukraine as a hotbed of orthodox tensions in exchange for a lasting peace among Orthodox Christians in Ukraine. Thank you for your attention.